All right. Well, good evening, everybody. My name is Kyle Denny, and I'm a planetary educator here at the Pure Riverfront Museum. And I'm really excited to introduce my co-worker and friend, Nick Ray, who will be presenting on the really cool and exciting missions coming up to the Red Planet. Now, before we begin, I want to give a quick shout out to the Visionary Society, as well as our membership. Without your guys' support during these times, the content we've been producing as a museum simply would not be possible. And we thank you guys so very much. So without further ado, I will let Nick take over to be able to give us his presentation. Go ahead, Nick. All right, thanks, Kyle. Um, by the way, Kyle, you can interrupt me anytime with anything you wanna add and anybody watching this live can send questions in and we'll try to answer them live as they come in. And also afterwards, we'll stick around a little bit if you have questions, but. I'll, I'll interject really quickly and say, yes. if you have any questions, feel free to type them in the comments below and we'll answer them to the best of our ability. Um, also, we really appreciate it if you go ahead and share this video, if you find this content really interesting, share it with your friends, give it a like, like our page if you wanna see more live streams like this. And sorry to interrupt you, Nick, but go ahead. No, thank you. Successful test of the interruption system, so <laughs> welcome. Um, yeah, NASA is one, NASA's got uh, an awesome new rover headed to the red planet. It's not the only mission launching to Mars uh, this summer, but want to give you guys the information of what the new, especially the new NASA mission is all about and how you can experience the launch live and then the landing live and then be able to follow the mission as it uh, hopefully uh, explores the red planet next year. So we'll give you all that information and some context of, of uh, previous missions to Mars and the other missions that are going to Mars and some history of our understanding of Mars. So we'll start way back in the ancient past. Oh. <laughs> Let me just let Lucy say hi to everybody. She's a Mars fan. You say hi. I gotta, Hi, Lucy. She's got her cool space dress on. <laughs> um, so here's uh, the view of Mars that anybody can see um, the right time when it's up in the sky. And it will be up in the sky late tonight after midnight. But by the time we get to October, you'll be able to see it in the sky all night long. And it will look like a bright orange star and it will be brighter than any of the stars in the sky. So it'll be pretty obvious, but it was obvious to people thousands of years ago, tens of thousands of years ago, people could see this bright light in the sky. And that's all it was, it was a light in the sky. There was no understanding that it was another world that uh, one day people would send machines to go explore. Now, when you watch Mars, uh, and, and again, a long time ago, thousands of years ago, People did watch Mars closely um, because unlike the stars, which just stay in the same patterns like Orion the Hunter or the Big Dipper, when you watch Mars and the other planets, uh, you see them moving across the sky um, from night to night relatively slowly. Um, today we know this is because they're going around the sun. But a weird thing happens, and this happens to Mars every two years and two months, as you watch it moving across the sky night to night, it'll, go, it'll be going in one direction for two years and two months and then stop and change directions for a little while, going in the other direction, but just for a while, then it'll stop and it will continue forward in its same general motion for the next two years and two months, which was very strange behavior for people trying to make sense of the universe. Today, we know it's, it's just the fact that Earth, we are on a planet that is moving around the sun. And we're moving around the sun faster than Mars. And we actually catch up to Mars every two years and two months. And when we lap Mars, just like if you're passing a car on the highway and you look out the window, the car will appear to be going backwards while you're passing it. When we pass by Mars, it 
seems to stop and go backwards for a little bit before it continues forward. And as I mentioned, it's not just Mars that does this, the other planets do this because they're all orbiting the sun. That's actually where the name planets comes from, from the old Greek word for wanderer. Again, nowadays we think of planet as a world. A long time ago, it was just a wandering star. It wandered through the different uh, background stars and, and constellations. And our name for this particular planet, Mars, well, the, all the names of the planets come from the ancient Greek and Roman gods, mostly Roman gods, but uh, Mars is named for the god of war, uh, presumably because of the color of the planet, nicknamed the red planet, actually looks kind of orange in the sky, but you can associate, associate that with uh, blood red. It's actually caused by iron in our blood as well as iron on the surface of Mars. So that was the view in, in, in antiquity. And it wasn't until uh, you know, we had the Copernican revolution and the understanding that the earth was going around the sun and that all the planets were going around the sun and that therefore the earth is a planet and therefore the planets are other worlds. And once the telescope was invented in the early 1600s and people like Galileo started looking up into the sky uh, at stars and planets that they were able to see that the planets are different from stars, not just in their movements, but that they are, when you look at them through a telescope, disks. And so here's a view, low resolution view, similar to what people would have had hundreds of years ago, looking through a telescope at Mars. And if you look closely, you might see there's some places that are a little bit darker. You might notice there's a little bit of a brighter white spot near the top. And as the telescopes improved over the centuries, well, people kept looking at the planets and looking at Mars and mapping it in better detail, giving names to the dark features and the bright features on the planet and really mapping it out as a world uh, the same way we map out the Earth. And while people were making these maps and seeing you know, slightly better features on Mars and details, uh, especially science fiction writers, let their imaginations run wild with the possibilities that uh, Mars could be a planet inhabited by other creatures, intelligent beings, maybe on an ancient dying civilization running out of water. Um, for one thing, Mars is farther from the sun, so people could deduce that it would be colder uh, out there at the distance of Mars. So that was kind of a science fiction view of the red planet and the popular view in the early 1900s. And things didn't really change from science fiction view to science until we got to the space age, which started with the launch of the first satellite on a rocket back in on October 4th, 1957, Sputnik. And once we could send satellites in orbit around the Earth, it wasn't long before we could send satellites out to the moon and, and then out to the planets. And actually, the, the only time we send uh, missions out to Mars is when we lap Mars. So we have this opportunity every two years and two months. And when that opportunity comes, we say a launch window has opened. So the first launch window in the space age, um, way back in 1960, there were two satellites sent from the Earth uh, with the hope of, of them flying out to Mars and giving us our first uh, close-up looks at Mars. Soviet Union spacecraft, well, they both failed. And as we go through uh, all the Kind of briefly go through all the missions that have been launched to the red planet. The, the Soviet Union did not have a good track record uh, sending missions to Mars. So they made the first two attempts and a couple of years later, the next launch window, three more failed attempts. So still we're in the space age, early days of the space age and the space race trying to get uh, astronauts to the moon um, and uh, trying to get these first missions to Mars but still not seeing it up close. That changed when we got to the third opportunity in uh, missions launched in late 1964, which included another failed attempt by the Soviet Union. It also included a failed attempt by the United States, by NASA, but it also included a successful attempt by NASA. Um, and NASA sent these two spacecraft, Mariner 3 and Mariner 4, basically the same spacecraft, just to double their chances of having success, and it worked. While the one failed, the other one flew by Mars on July 14th, 1965, and gave us our first close-up pictures of, of Mars. This is actually the first uh, close-up image that we saw of Mars. This is not a photograph we're looking at. The 
spacecraft actually took black and white photos. This is a hand colored kind of paint by number picture that was put together because the computers at the time were so slow, they didn't, and the uh, people were, the scientists were impatient to see what the first pictures coming back were. Well, they're just data with, with numbers of how bright or how dark uh, each pixel was. And so while they were waiting for the computer to actually process this data and turn it into a black and white picture, they went and got art supplies and did uh, uh, put numbers at each of the pixels and then color uh, coordinated them with kind of the dark, uh, dark browns being darker regions going to lighter whites and yellows for the lighter regions. But this is just black and white, the actual picture. Let me show you now. There's a comparison of the, the hand colored picture on the left with the actual photograph that was uh, then finally processed as a black and white picture. First close-up picture of the surface of Mars. Again, this is back in the 60s, uh, not the awesome pictures that we're used to seeing from Mars today, but it was close up and you could see some clouds hanging out. There's some clouds located over there on the edge on the horizon of Mars. It's pretty cool. And there's, as it flew by, it just flew by the planet, didn't go into orbit. Just the flyby, zoom by, took 22 close-up pictures, and those were our first close-up looks at the red planet from Mariner 4. No attempts, the next launch window, but the following one, four missions launched to the red planet, including two more <laughs> failed attempts by the Soviet Union and two more successful flybys by the United States, by NASA, Mariner 6 and Mariner 7. If you're wondering what the other Mariners were, like 1 and 2 and Mariner 5 and some other ones later, those went to other planets like Venus and Mercury. So, so same designs, but going out to different planets. And they just flew by Mars again, both flybys taking pictures up close of Mars with slightly better technology. And then we get to launch window 6. And this is after people have landed on the moon. Um, NASA was still landing people on the moon. And this, these included the first successful orbiters around Mars. So instead of just flying by, which is easier, it's harder because to go into orbit, you gotta fire your thrusters at just the right time in just the right position for just the right length of time and to go in, to get into orbit around, around the planet. And then you can study it for a lot longer period. So three successful missions went into orbit uh, during this launch window, uh, including NASA's Mariner 9 and two Soviet orbiters, which also brought two landers. The landers both failed. So they tried to actually land on the red planet, uh, but both of those failed. However, interesting fact, Mars, the Mars 3 mission did land and for 14 seconds it sent, sent back data, but then they lost contact with it, never heard from it again. So it was successfully, uh, you know, technically a successful landing but we didn't get anything from it, only 14 seconds and, and that was it. But uh, NASA's Mariner 9 was a fantastic uh, mission. When I got there, I had to wait a few months because there was a dust storm completely covering the entire planet, which happens from time to time. And you can't see any features on the surface, but after the dust cleared, you could see some of the awesome geology on Mars, including uh, an enormous canyon system and, and several enormous volcanoes. So the canyon system, and you can see it to scale, would stretch all the way across the continental United States, way bigger, not only longer than the Grand Canyon out in Arizona, but there you can see on the bottom a side-by-side -side comparison of how much wider the, the valley is on Mars and also how much deeper it is on Mars compared to the Grand Canyon. And it was named Valleys Marineris, Mariner Valley after the Mariner 9 spacecraft, which first saw it um, while it was orbiting Mars there uh, for about a year, 1971 to 1972. And here's the biggest volcano then on, on Mars, uh, Olympus Mons. You can see it would completely cover all of Illinois and it's two and a half times taller than Mount Everest. And it's an ancient, dormant volcano, maybe it'll erupt again someday in the future, but no signs of any eruptions in, in recent uh, geologic history. 
or anywhere else on Mars that we've seen any volcanic eruptions. That's one of many, many, many giant volcanoes on the red planet. So those were revealed from that first successful NASA orbiter back in the early 70s. All right, next launch window, four failed attempts from the Soviet Union, including uh, two more attempts at, at landing on the surface. And then the next launch window, uh, the Vikings, the, the most successful uh, NASA missions uh, back in the 70s to the Red Planet, which two Vikings, again, to double the chances of success. And each Viking was carried by an orbiter and dropped a lander down to the surface. The orbiters were all, both successful. The landers were both successful. And so the orbiters went around Mars for a number of years and were able to make wonderful, beautiful maps of the surface that could be stitched together to give us you know, a nice overall global view like you see here with, there's valleys, marineris. There's some more big volcanoes over on the side, all taller than Mount Everest. You can see some ancient uh, flows of water, river, river patterns there um, on the red planet, really successful missions. And then actual pictures from the surface. Uh, Viking 1 made the first landing on Mars, July 20th, 1976. That's, that's seven, or, uh, yeah, seven years to the day that Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin first walked on the moon. So NASA made the famous moon landing with Apollo 11, and then seven years later made the first robotic landing on the red planet. The picture on the bottom, the black and white picture, that is the first uh, picture returned from the surface of Mars or any other planet. Up on the upper left, the first color picture, you can see rusty dust all over the place covering all the rocks. You can see the kind of uh, orange sky on Mars because of all the rust and rusty dust floating around up there. And you can see some places where the uh, robotic arm was digging into the soil. They were doing some experiments to look for possible signs of life that might be living on Mars or in the soil right now today. Uh, got some negative results and some inconclusive results, so um, don't really know. There's still a possibility. People still hold out the possibility that there could be life on Mars today, on Mars today, but probably deeper down, maybe in, in places where Viking couldn't have reached uh, at the time. And when we get to perseverance, we're going to talk about how they're looking for possible life, ancient life on Mars, evidence of possible uh, life on Mars billions of years ago. Viking 2 landed on the other side of the planet. Um, there's a beautiful picture of sunset, or maybe it's sunrise. I think that's actually sunrise on Mars. There's a picture of the ground showing frost that formed. We saw from the early, earlier Mariner picture, clouds in the atmosphere. Those are clouds of water vapor. It's a very thin atmosphere of Mars, but um, there's a little bit of water vapor in there, and that condenses into frost on the ground when it gets cold enough at high enough elevations during the winter time. And there's a Calvin and Hobbes when Calvin and Hobbes went to Mars and uh, came across one of the Vikings and made some funny faces in the in front of the cameras on Mars. All right, now we hit the doldrums. So after that dramatic, awesome success in that buildup where you see almost every launch window, either the Soviet Union or the United States or both are sending missions to Mars, getting better and better and better, flybys, um, orbiters and then landers. Now we hit the doldrums where nobody is sending anything to Mars for a long time. Lots of times we're passing by Mars every two years and two months. Nothing is going to the red planet. Finally, 12 years, uh, 12 years after Viking landed on Mars, uh, the Soviet Union made their last attempt at sending a uh, spacecraft to Mars, uh, last attempt before the Soviet Union collapsed a few years later. Um, and both of these uh, um, orbiters lost contact. One, one loss we lost contact with on the way to Mars. The other one got to Mars, but very soon lost contact. So we did get, you know, here's a cool picture of one of the two little moons of Mars, Phobos, not round, not big enough to be round. Got two little moons that look like asteroids. Um, but both of those are essentially failures because it was only only briefly there before it lost uh, lost contact with it. And then a little bit after that, uh, the United States decides to get back in the game, but unfortunately uh, lost uh, contact with with their new big heavy duty um, orbiter um, just days before it got to Mars. So it had been traveling for months and months and months, 
actually takes about anywhere from like six to nine months roughly uh, for these missions to get out to Mars. So communicating with it, lost communication just few, a few days before it got to the red planet, unfortunately. But in the wake of that failure, NASA did some reorganizing and kind of made a whole new division within their planetary science division called the Mars Exploration Program, where they would uh, allocate a certain amount of money every year towards building missions that are gonna be addressing certain scientific uh, questions about the red planet and we gradually build up knowledge of it and capability. And this has been a what they've been following now since the early 90s. There's still Perseverance, the new Mars rover uh, that NASA is sending is part of this Mars exploration program. So two launch windows later in the mid 90s, well, there was another, not, again, not the Soviet Union, but Russia uh, sent, tried to send a, a mission to Mars, which uh, did not even get out of Earth orbit. So another, uh, continuing their string of failures, but NASA sent the very successful Glo Mars Global Surveyor uh, to orbit the red planet and map it. And, and, and uh, I'll show you their map in just a moment. And another landing on Mars to bring the first rover to Mars as a, 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 a test of the concept of actually driving around basically a remote controlled car on the red planet. So Mars Global Surveyor, it orbited Mars uh, for almost a decade and did a whole bunch of cool science stuff, uh, including this fantastic elevation map of Mars, um, where you can see, you can see the white areas here where the, vol the giant volcanoes are popping out. There's uh, five of these colored white here that are all taller than Mount Everest. You can see the low elevations in blue. Notice how smooth, and the lower elevations in the Northern Hemisphere. The Southern Hemisphere is higher elevation, rougher terrain, more craters. Uh, and you can even see Valleys Marineris uh, flowing out into these low elevations where there's clear erosion by water. Um, and we'll look at some other pictures up close from there. Um, evidence not only of, of ancient water on Mars, but possibly an ancient ocean on Mars, an ancient meaning more than 3 billion years ago. But these elevation maps are still used today. Um, uh, for example, when, we look, when you look at the Perseverance stuff and where it's gonna land and, and people use these elevation maps to, to get a handle on, on where they'll be landing on the red planet. And this uh, lander and rover made the landing on the 4th of July, so great uh, for uh, you know, United States Independence Day, 4th of July, and their uh, space agency landed and sent out the, a couple days later the first uh, rover to drive around on the red planet. So there's the little rover. It's called Sojourner. It was named by a student, which same with Perseverance. All of the rovers that NASA has sent to Mars have been named by kids, by students in, in essay contests, and I'm sure that condition will... Uh, that, uh, that will continue that tradition. So for future missions, uh, if you have any kids, know any kids or any kids watching and you're in school, you'll have a chance to maybe name the next rover or mission going to Mars. Um, the lander was renamed after landing the Carl Sagan Memorial Station. Carl Sagan, great scientist, planetary scientist, worked on NASA missions, great popularizer, uh, brought science and astronomy to the public, had a great influence, many, of the scientists working on the current missions at Mars, um, you know, got learned a lot of astronomy and got hooked on on astronomy and science from from uh, watching and listening to Carl Sagan decades ago. Well, he had passed away um, in between the launch of this mission and the landing, and so the, as a tribute, they named that the Carl Sagan Memorial Station. And by the way, that rover they they named the rocks. I don't know all the names of the rocks, but this rock that the rovers next to is called the Yogi Rock. You can sort of see a bear, a profile of a bear, if you use your imagination there, Yogi Bear. All right, well, after that great success, unfortunately, the next launch window, two failures. Um, we had, uh, NASA had a, a lander that was gonna land closer to the, the poles on, uh, closer to the South Pole on Mars, but it crashed. 
And uh, they also had a satellite that was going into orbit around Mars to study the climate of Mars. And it probably crashed, or maybe it, it might have missed the planet, burned up or something, or, or just went around the planet. Uh, infamously, the reason that missed, we, we figured out, was because of a software mistake where they, you know, you have units, you have feet and miles, but then there's also units like meters and kilometers. And one of the things in the software was in feet and miles instead of meters and kilometers. And that, it's, everything's got to work, everything's got to be perfect, and there's essentially no room for error. And that little error in the software um, that they didn't detect um, cost them this expensive Mars mission. Japan also sent a mission to Mars, but uh, this is the only attempt Japan has made uh, to the Red Planet, which which failed, um, unfortunately. They've had uh, some success sending missions to the Moon and Venus, and they've got one go going uh, to Mercury right now, just uh, failed on their uh, attempt at Mars. All right, well, after that uh, NASA failure, now we're going through a string of success that will hopefully continue with perseverance. So uh, a couple of years after those failures, NASA sends Mars Odyssey, which not only was successful, it is still operating in orbit around Mars today. Um, I check their website every almost every day. They put out a new picture every day. Um, so it is still operational and doing awesome science at the Red Planet. And there's a low resolution or far away picture, I should say, an actual photograph of Odyssey orbiting Mars taken by another satellite. My Odyssey was, uh, oh, by the global surveyor that we saw that was orbiting for 10 years. It photographed uh, Odyssey while orbiting Mars, which is pretty cool. So the next launch window, um, two fantastically successful NASA rovers, Spirit and Opportunity, again, named by students. And Europe uh, sent a satellite and a lander, the satellite Mars Express, very successful and still orbiting Mars today. And every few weeks or few months, they put out uh, a fantastic picture with new science and discoveries um, by the European scientists. They're, um, Lander, unfortunately, uh, did not succeed. We actually know it landed. Now we've have been photographed it on the surface, but it did not open up all the panels and was not able to communicate. So that was a, a non-success. So there's, a, there's an example of the awesome pictures that Mars Express sends back to us. Uh, I believe that's the South Pole of Mars. That's the polar ice cap. There's one at the North Pole as well, covered frozen water, huge quantities of frozen water, and also dry ice that just comes out of the atmosphere. Again, very thin atmosphere. I mentioned the water vapor. We saw the frost in an earlier picture. By the way, this is why the Mars doll has, has the white hair on top. Um, but uh, the carbon dioxide, it's mostly carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and it gets cold enough to make dry ice. It also warms up then in the summertime, and the dry ice sublimates back into gas. And that's why you see some of these awesome swirling patterns because it's depositing and, and then turning back into gas and making winds and knocking things loose. It's causing avalanches, causing all sorts of cool stuff by the polar ice caps. And then the two awesome rovers, which were sent for a three month mission to Mars, Spirit was able to drive around and explore the red planet covering miles. It was up there for six years successfully driving around. There's uh, it landed, it made a cool landing, just like the Pathfinder, where it was kind of bundled up inside a bunch of airbags that then just bounced around and, and then deflated and opened up and started driving away. And there's a beautiful sunset on Mars where you get the color changing from orange to blue. Cool little logo they had with Marvin the Martian. And for the twin opportunity, they gave the Duck Dodgers um, cool cool little logo. And Opportunity was even more successful. Both of these uh, missions, by the way, were sent to look for evidence of water on Mars. They both found evidence of water affecting uh, the rocks on Mars. The, the Spirit rover 
um, found volcanic rocks, which had been slightly altered by, by water, uh, not long periods, so probably not a lake or anything, although maybe there's evidence of an ancient lake buried there, but um, slight uh, um, chemical changes from water flowing there and much more substantial um, water um, changes to the rocks where Opportunity was driving around. And it actually covered over tw 25 miles on Mars. It has set the record. You can see it's gone farther, uh, farther than a, a Soviet rover that drove around on the moon, farther than the, the three rovers that NASA sent to the moon with the Apollo, the last three Apollo landings to drive around on the moon. Uh, so incredibly successful mission. There's a cool picture. Uh, it drove by its heat shield. So there, it cr the heat shield crashed and kind of got destroyed, but there it drove by the heat shield. There's some awesome exposed bedrock uh, on the inside of a crater. There's a selfie it was able to take, take a bunch of pictures and stitch them together to take a picture of itself on Mars. There's a meteorite on Mars. By the way, we have meteorites on Earth that come to us from Mars. And one of the reasons we know that is because we've had missions land on Mars and we can compare the atmosphere of Mars to the gases that can, are sometimes trapped in little pockets inside these meteorites and they match the Martian atmosphere that tells us they come, come from the red planet. And here's a cool picture showing the tracks of opportunity and in the distance, is it looks like a little tornado. That's a dust devil, a swirling uh, funnel of dust that can sometimes stretch for miles high in the sky. And they've made awesome movies watching these zip across um, the, the dusty landscape of Mars. And uh, here we get to, I think my favorite uh, satellite orbiting Mars. It's still orbiting Mars today. Went uh, in 2005, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter takes the highest resolution pictures of, of Mars from the surface. And it sees, uh, first of all, it sees robots on Mars. It sees robots landing on Mars. It sees changes on Mars. It sees craters uh, being that have been made by asteroids and stuff crashing into Mars while it's there. And here's an awesome picture of an avalanche on Mars. I mentioned the dry ice. You can see the top of a cliff. Here's the side of a cliff dry ice sublimating into, ga into gas as it's heated in the, in the summer months of Mars, knocking soil and dirt loose and causing it to um, slide down that cliff. This is in the process of sliding down and hitting the, the bottom of the cliff there, knocking up a cloud of dust. Just awesome stuff that we couldn't see before. And now we can see, again, this is still orbiting Mars today. And uh, like the... Uh, um, um, well, like the other earlier Mars mission we mentioned, um, Mars Odyssey, it's, it's still putting out a picture every day. So I check, check every day almost their website and you can see an awesome close-up picture of Mars. All right, next launch window, another successful NASA mission. I mentioned the other one that failed that was gonna land near the South Pole. Well, this was kind of a, a, a little bit of a cheaper version uh, with some of the similar, similar instruments doing the same, similar science landed near the North Pole of Mars in the polar regions and uh, worked for a few months up there. The Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter we just saw was able to photograph Phoenix while it was making its landing with the parachute, slowing it down. And there's a picture that it took of Phoenix on the surface, just awesome high resolution pictures. There's a picture from Phoenix looking out across the horizon. Um, there's some soil that it's scooped up and there's where it's dug underground and just right underground, you can see ice. Um, we detected ice uh, with earlier satellites underground. And this was just kind of a way to confirm that that is what they were detecting, that there is, that there are large quantities of ice under the surface of Mars. Now, once the ice is exposed to the surface because of the low uh, atmospheric pressure, it actually, vaporizes and, and disappears, it doesn't melt, it disappears into, into water vapor um, after a few days or weeks. All right, no launches in the next window, although there was supposed to be one. Curiosity was supposed to launch in that uh, previous window, wasn't ready on time. And if you're not ready on time, you can't just, if you're a month late, you can't launch a month late. 
You have a narrow window when we're passing by Mars. Instead, you have to wait two years and two months. So that's what Curiosity did. It launched in 2011, landed in 2012. Russia uh, partnered with China to send uh, another mission um, out to Mars, which got, did not make it out of Earth orbit. So another um, failure on that attempt. But Curiosity, again, named by a student, has been awesome. And it is roving the red planets right now. Um, it's the only one, it's one of two active missions on Mars. There's also six active satellites orbiting Mars, but it's the one that's moving around and it takes awesome selfies. It's got a robotic arm and it takes a bunch of pictures, you stitch them together. And because the arm is moving in each picture, you kind of uh, digitally remove the arm. And so it looks like somebody's there taking a picture of, of it. It looks like it's got a, a head with two eyes. These are two cameras. Um, this is the mountain, Mount Sharp, uh, about three miles high, I think. Very tall mountain. It is making its way up that mountain. That mountain is not a volcano. It is actually sediment that has been deposited inside a very big crater. And some of that sediment, as it's made its way up there, it's been studying the rocks. Some of that sediment was deposited in an ancient lake on Mars over three billion years ago, a lake that could could have possibly been habitable, uh, might have had the right conditions for life. Haven't found any evidence of life, although it's not really directly looking for evidence of ancient life on Mars, just looking to see whether this was a place, an environment billions of years ago where Mars could have uh, had the conditions for, for potential life, microscopic life on, on Mars. And there again, you see awesome pictures from the reconnaissance orbiter of it descending through the atmosphere with the parachute. And there it is on the surface. And you can actually see some of its first uh, tracks that it made as it started traveling across uh, the surface of Mars and then climbing up that mountain on Mars. And again, go to the website. They usually have new, they have new pictures every day. They have a blog post that's updated every couple of days. You can follow the mission and, and watch the maps and, and follow the exploration and be part of Part of the adventure, which you couldn't be, you know, 20, 25 years ago, before the internet, you couldn't do that. You just have to wait until you heard about it or maybe get an astronomy magazine and get updates months later. Now you can follow along with the mission. And, the, and again, when we get the Perseverance, we'll show you how you can follow along from launch to landing and then onto the exploration. All right, next launch window, uh, a NASA satellite, MAVEN, uh, which is still orbiting Mars. It's studying the atmosphere and how it's escaping into space. Mars used to have a much thicker atmosphere, and so that's trying to understand how Mars has lost its atmosphere over time. And India, uh, which has had a, uh, which has already had a successful satellite at the moon, and they've got their second successful satellite at the moon right now, uh, has a satellite orbiting Mars, the Mars Orbiter mission, MOM. So their first interplanetary spacecraft still orbiting the red planet. All right, next launch window was uh, we're back in 2016, Europe, European Space Agency, and uh, um, they sent a satellite and a lander. Satellite is still orbiting Mars successfully. The lander failed, and this is a picture from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter of where it crashed on the surface. Um, NASA, the United States, is the, is the only country to successfully land on Mars. They're eight for nine landing on Mars. We saw, I don't know how many failed attempts from the Soviet Union and Russia, and now Europe has had two failed attempts as well. To give you an idea, it is hard. Mars is harder to land on than the moon um, or Venus, and that's because unlike the moon, Mars has a little bit of atmosphere, so you can't just use rocket, retro rockets and, and stuff and just uh, safely land. You have to worry about the atmosphere and have a heat shield and deal with all that heat coming in. Um, you also, unlike Venus, which has a really thick atmosphere, you can just put a parachute on it and it'll slow it down. You can't do that on Mars because it has such a thin atmosphere. So it makes it the hardest planet to land on. And you can see that by the failed attempts by uh, Europe and Russia and the Soviet Union. But NASA now is eight for nine. And 2018 was their most recent mission to Mars, it was the most recent launch window to Mars, uh, the 44th launch uh, sending spacecraft to Mars. 
um, the InSight mission, which successfully landed November 26th to measure the inside of the red planet. Uh, so here's a cool selfie it took showing its solar panels. And here is two uh, science experiments on the surface. One of them, the mole, is, was supposed to hammer itself 16 feet underground to measure the heat coming out from inside of Mars, basically measure how hot it is inside of Mars. But that has not been able to get underground. So they had expectations, reasonable expectations for how the soil would work on Mars and, and how they could design this to actually get underground, but that has not panned out. And so they have not gotten measurements from that and it does not look promising, although they're still making attempts. It does not look promising. The other one has been very successful and is the main one. It is a seismometer. Seismometers measure earthquakes on Mars. We call those Mars quakes. It's detected hundreds of Mars quakes and that is uh, helping scientists make a 3D map of the inside of Mars. So we've got all these great maps of the surface of Mars. We've got pictures from the surface of Mars, radar showing us a little bit underground, but now we're gonna get to actually understand the core, the mantle, the crust, how deep down do you have to go before it gets so hot that it's liquid inside, just like we understand that about our planet. Um, which is, and then we can compare the Earth to the to Mars, not only learn about Mars, but learn about our planet and how it's different and why it's different from planets, smaller planets like Mars. And again, awesome to see a spacecraft photographed by another spacecraft that's from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter showing insight on the surface of Mars, where it's still operating today and taking pictures every day. You can see the pictures every day on their website but it's not driving around. So it's basically the same picture almost every day. And this is the launch window we're in now. We've got a brief window of a few weeks um, where uh, new missions could go to Mars without having to wait two years and two months to the next window. And right now we've got three planned launches coming up in the next few weeks. So the United Arab Emirates is hoping to send their first satellite to Mars in uh, celebration in honor of their the 50th birthday of the United Arab Emirates, which will be next year. China, which has had uh, four successful missions at, at the moon, in, uh, robotic missions at the moon, including two robotic landers and rovers, and an active lander and rover right now on the far side of the moon are gonna make their first attempt at an interplanetary mission, a satellite, a lander, and a rover at the red planet. We believe they're going to be launching uh, next week. And then NASA, their most complicated, heaviest duty capable rover yet, Perseverance, specifically now that we've, you know, first we sent to see if a rover could work, then to see if there was any evidence that there was water that was on the surface of Mars in the past. And we looked like with curiosity to see if this is the kind of water that persisted for long periods of time and had the right kind of uh, chemical composition that would be favorable to microscopic life. And since we've checked off yes on all of those boxes, um, you know, now we know the, the potential for microscopic life on ancient Mars is there. So Perseverance is gonna be looking for possible signs of ancient life on Mars. By the way, there was originally going to be a fourth mission launching to Mars in this launch window, a European robotic lander. Again, they're 0 for 2 on their landings. Hopefully the third time's a charm. Uh, the Rosalind Franklin rover, which is named after the uh, woman who took x-ray photographs of uh, DNA, which is how they were able to then deduce that awesome, famous double helical structure of DNA based on those x-ray photographs. And it'll be doing similar stuff when it lands on Mars hopefully successfully, not, not during this launch window, but the next one, it'll be looking like Perseverance for evidence of ancient life on Mars. But uh, they could not get it ready. They could not get in trouble with the parachute. It's not ready to go. And again, you can't just get it ready and then launch it when it's ready. You have to wait two years and two months, unfortunately. But something to look forward to during the next launch window. But for this launch window, Mars Hope, again, that's the United Arab Emirates. They 
do you have a space agency and they had their first astronaut launch into space just last fall. They went uh, on a Russian Soyuz spaceship uh, with a Russian cosmonaut and uh, the NASA American astronaut, uh, Jessica Mir. So the three of them went to the space station, the Russian and the American stayed for like six months or so, or maybe even longer. Uh, but then the, the, the Emirates astronaut uh, came back down with two other astronauts about a week later or so. So he went up there for about a, a week or 10 days, something like that. So they do have astronauts and now they've had an astronaut in space and now they're sending their first, their first robotic mission. Uh, they're just bypassing the moon and going straight for this interplanetary mission to Mars, again, to coincide with the 50th birthday of the United Arab Emirates, which uh, started in 1971. So it'll arrive in Mars, hopefully, in, in February of 2021. And again, uh, don't have too many details, but China of when this is going to launch, but hopefully, or we think in the next week or so, China is going to be launching their first mission, interplanetary mission. They've had four successful missions at the moon, and they've launched, they have launched their own uh, astronauts into space on their own rockets in their own spaceships and even sent them to their own small space station. So they, they've all in the 21st century. So they have developed a very capable space agency and they're gonna be making their first interplanetary robotic mission, a, an orbiter, a lander, and a rover. Um, so, and it's called Tianwen One, which is Chinese for Heavenly Questions, which is apparently the name of their interplanetary program. So maybe future missions, not just to Mars, but to other planets will have that, that name. All right, now let's finish by just looking at the NASA rover. Perseverance, also known, it was known as Mars 2020 for a long time, because um, they had to wait till it had the official name. They had the student contest. Um, where people sent in essays, and this is like anywhere from like kindergarten through 12th grade, I think, um, send in essays, your suggestion and why it should be named this. And they announced the winner, Alex Mather, um, a seventh grader in Virginia, I believe, uh, came up with the name Perseverance, had a great explanation for it. And that name is now etched onto the arm, the robotic arm of the rover. And so you'll see it. Hopefully when it's on Mars taking photographs, you'll see its name in some of those pictures. Um, and yeah, something cool for the next Mars rover, whenever that's coming, um, great way to get students involved and aware. And again, cause now, now you can follow, if, you know, there's tons of space nerds out there. And if I was, when I was a kid, if I could have been following on the internet, all these missions to other planets, I would have been doing that. Um, it's a great opportunity, not just for everybody to be involved, but especially people who love this stuff. If you love it, you don't have to wait for it to come to come to you. You can go to the NASA website. They have a specific website. Again, Mars Exploration Program. They have a specific website just for Mars uh, with all their missions going on and coming up. And you can follow all the missions there and, and see that. So um, a great way to get everybody aware of this and to participate in it. By the way, this is how, it's, oh, I, I didn't mention that, but Curiosity is powered with plutonium. Same thing with Perseverance. The earlier rovers were solar powered. Plutonium is uh, not only the same energy source that uh, Curiosity is using on Mars right now, climbing up that mountain of sediment deposited in an ancient lake, but is also the energy source of the time traveling DeLorean in the first Back to the Future movie, if you remember, he had to steal plutonium to, to power the, the, the time machine. Uh, so that'll be uh, uh, powering the Perseverance rover as well. It means it can operate any time of the day. Um, it'll just gradually lose power very slowly over time, but hopefully um, its nominal mission is one Mars year, which is about 687 days. A little less than, than two Earth years, but um, that was also true of Curiosity. And Curiosity has now been climbing up that mountain for uh, coming up on eight years. So hopefully it'll be going much longer past its past its warranty. 
with some of the cool things it's going to have on it. There's its head look. By the way, it's the same uh, same design as Curiosity. The same basic plan and size. It is a little bit heavier because it's got different science experiments and upgrades to, to the quality. So for example, um, uh, Curiosity also had this hole in the top of its head um, called ChemCam. Well, this is called SuperCam because it's even more capable, better technology, more recent technology. But like uh, Curiosity, it's going to be able to shoot an invisible infrared laser at distant rocks, vaporize them, and then take pictures to actually determine what those rocks are made of and whether it's worth driving the rover in that direction to go take a closer look with some of the other science experiments. So really cool laser on the head of Perseverance. Two eyes, just like we saw on Curiosity, except on Curiosity, there is a wide angle and a narrow angle. These are both the same size, wide angle, and so they'll be able to take actual true 3D photographs, beautiful 3D photographs, and it's called MassCam Z. The Z is for zoom. They'll be able to zoom in from a distance, again, uh, to investigate places to potentially drive the Perseverance rover while it looks for possible signs of ancient life on Mars. Also, for the, hopefully for the first time, we will hear the, some sounds on Mars. There's a microphone right next to the laser. And then every time they shoot the laser, they're going to have the microphone listening for the sound of the laser. Um, there's going to be another microphone that'll be listening as, as Perseverance comes through the atmosphere with its heat shield and, and, and then makes its precise landing. And I'll, we'll talk about that in, a little, in just a moment. But uh, we'll hopefully hear the sounds of Mars as it's rushing through the atmosphere and getting pushed around by the air and throwing off the heat shield and deploying the parachute and touching down on the surface. Hopefully that'll, the sounds, not only the video of that, but the sounds of that'll be recorded. It'll, and those will make awesome, awesome movies of landing on Mars. If we look uh, down below the head to the neck, it'll have a, just like Curiosity, a weather station, same with InSight, so we can measure the atmosphere of Mars and the, the temperature and humidity, um, how much dust is in the atmosphere, how big is the dust, and all sorts of stuff like that. Temperatures on Mars uh, get very cold. Uh, you know, it's farther away, and with the thin atmosphere at night, and especially in the winter, it can drop down you know, more than 100 below zero. But during, you know, high, high noon or early in the afternoon, sometimes you know near the equator or in the summertime, above when the sun's right overhead. Uh, temperatures can get up to 50, 60 degrees. Very thin atmosphere, though. Um, but so that's a weather weather station on Perseverance. This is a, a chemistry thing going inside of Perseverance Moxie. It is going to take the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, which is most of the atmosphere of Mars is carbon dioxide. There is no oxygen. There's no oxygen in the atmosphere of Mars or any other planet in the solar system except for Earth. And the only reason it's on Earth is because of bacteria and algae and plants, which take carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and turn it in. And while they're doing their chemistry, selfishly doing chemistry for themselves to survive, make oxygen that they don't need that comes out. And that's, and if those things all died, we would breathe in the oxygen and use it up and it would go away very slowly. So there's no oxygen on Mars, but this is a test to see for future astronauts living on Mars, whether we could grab that oxygen on a much larger scale, just to test uh, to see if it's feasible, to grab that carbon dioxide and uh, turn it into oxygen that not only you could use for breathing, but also for uh, fuel, because you uh, rocket fuel, oxygen and hydrogen combined together and you can create explosions and you can launch rockets. So really cool thing, looking forward to the future for sending people to the red planet. This is a radar uh, instrument, RIMFAX, which is named after the horse of night in Norse mythology, because uh, some uh, uh, Nordic, I don't know if it was a government agency or a scientific agency, 
uh, built that. So they built it and contributed to this mission. It's going to be shooting radar below the surface of Mars and being and where Perseverance is driving, looking for changes in the composition of the bedrock, possible meteorites underground, possible deposits of ice underground or, or lava or even lava tubes. So it'll be measuring about 30 feet or so below the surface of wherever Perseverance is driving. Uh, Pixel, this is on its arm, which will be able to go out and take close-up pictures, in this case, using uh, shooting x-rays. We saw they got the cameras and the and, and chemistry stuff from far away. They can go get in really close and set its arm right on top of the rock, shoot x-rays on the rocks and the soil, and then see the glow that comes from those and see what they're made of. And so we'll be able to tell what elements are coming out. Is there lots of carbon? Is there lots of oxygen? You know, coming from chemicals uh, in the rocks, the kinds of uh, chemicals and elements that we see incorporated in living things here on Earth. And similar to that, also on the robotic arm, Sherlock uh, will be uh, looking at, it'll be shooting an ultraviolet laser up close. And again, it'll be able to tell what kind of minerals the rocks are made of. And then we can tell what those mineral, what elements those minerals are made of. Because some minerals get produced in life. Uh, we have calcium carbonate in our bones and, and stuff like that. So it'll be looking at the minerals of rocks up close, looking uh, not only just doing geology in general, but also um, trying to look for possible signs of ancient life on Mars, microscopic life. And when it finds really interesting samples that we want to look at e even with better scientific experiments, it will be able to drill a, a core from the ground of Mars and store it in these samples one at a time, a couple dozen of them. And at the end, uh, the plan is to leave that on the surface of Mars for a future mission, Mars sample return that NASA is right now working on plans with Europe to land go get those samples and then have a rocket on Mars that will launch back into orbit around Mars and then eventually bring those samples back to Earth. So hopefully someday those samples that Perseverance collects will be returned to the Earth and then we can do all sorts of awesome scientific experiments that are in laboratories all around the planet and you know, if really get a, a good sense of, of looking up close if there is of their ancient microscopic fossils in any of those samples and, and stuff like hey, Nick. that. Yeah. Nick, uh, sorry to interject, but we actually have a question from uh, Sinella. Uh, yes. I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name or anything like that, but how she asked, how long did it take to make this? I assume make this as in the rover, Perseverance. How, do you know how yeah. long? So I was amazed after Curiosity landed and I was listening to Planetary Radio Podcast. If you like science, great organization, you can join whatever your age, the Planetary Society, but listening to their podcast, and they were already making plans for Mars 2020 when Curiosity landed, uh, because it takes so long. You have to, so that was eight years ago when Curiosity landed. And then after making all these plans in uh, 2014, six years ago, they picked all of the different science experiments that they were going to take on this mission. And so for years after that, they were building all of these, and then they had to put them all together, bring them all together, test them, um, and eventually put them all together and go put them in a rocket. So they've been planning this specifically for at least eight years and uh, been building it and putting it together for the past six years. So it takes a really long time. Really cool job, by the way. So you, not only is it an astronaut an awesome job, of flying into space, but if you like space, you could be a scientist uh, exploring planets like Mars. You could be an engineer designing instruments to Mars or building them. Lots of cool ways to be involved in, in space exploration. And now, just now, as a fan, you can follow the mission on the website and and uh, and see all of it as it's happening. Now, this is really cool. This is another demonstration. Uh, we saw the rover that went uh, back in 1997. Just a, as a test, can we do that on Mars? And then bigger rovers followed, including Perseverance. Well, Perseverance is going to contain a test helicopter, a drone helicopter, very lightweight, four pounds. Uh, it has to be lightweight because the atmosphere on Mars is very thin, but it also has less gravity, which helps. 
the blades, there's two blades there that are they're gonna have to spin very fast. It's got some antennas. It's gonna take pictures. It's going to, uh, it'll, I don't forget how long, maybe a couple months after Perseverance lands, it'll make test flights for maybe up to three, three minutes at a time. Perseverance will be making movies of this while it's flying around on Mars. And it'll be taking pictures looking down on Mars and testing the feasibility of future rovers carrying more capable uh, helicopters with them to fly around and scout out where we should be sending these rovers, um, the best places to go exploring. So really exciting, really awesome. And the name Ingenuity was one of the names suggested in that name the rover contest. So it's kind of like the runner up and that's the name of the uh, helicopter. And there it is installed on the bottom of Perseverance, right over there. So when Perseverance lands and the legs come down, it'll eventually set this down on the ground, then drive away, and then turn on its video, it's, it's taking its video cameras and taking movies as this flies around in the sky at least five times within a month. That's the, that's the goal. All right, another cool way to be involved, if you didn't do this, but maybe with the next mission, send your name to Mars. Uh, in fact, you can already send your name on whatever the next mission is if you go to NASA's Mars, uh, Mars page. So more than 10 million people, 10,932,295 people sent their, sent their names in time that they were able to, using a little uh, electron laser, shoot, uh, drill out people's, sketch people's names into these microscopically into these little uh, silicon wafers, three of them. Uh, and so those are going to Mars. They'll be on Mars for future people, maybe living on Mars that can go look at them and see, maybe they'll see, oh, my great, 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 great grandmother's name is here on this. In the same way people come and look at their ancestors' names at Ellis Island when they came to the United States. So really cool, awesome way to get involved. You get a boarding pass that you can print out. Um, so yeah, check that out. You can already, they're already taking names so you can sign up and get your name on the next mission that goes to Mars. Oh, by the way, that's a cool, uh, no, I forget now uh, this, uh, let me just see. This is like Braille. This is, oh, sorry, I just say, let me try, let me try sharing that again. I was gonna, gonna look up what it actually I had it written in my notes, but it says explore as one in Morse code. All right. Let's see. All right. All right. Another cool thing that they're doing, uh, of course, they're doing the final stretch of this while the coronavirus pandemic is going on, which is making things much more complicated and much more slow to do all this stuff and, and harder. Um, and kind of as a tribute to that, they also put little things on these things so that the, the, the weight or the mass of everything is balanced just right. They put on uh, this plaque, which you can see attached to the side of the rover. It's called the rod of Asclepius, this rod with a snake going around it. And that is the symbol, the universal worldwide symbol of medicine. It goes back to some ancient Greek mythology about uh, Asclepius and his rod and, and seeing a snake uh, healing other, another snake with an herb and the birth of medicine. So it's tied into Greek mythology and it is on there and you can see it is carrying on top of the rod, the earth and, uh, and launching from the earth onto the red planet. You can see perseverance on its way. All right, so uh, here it is in Florida. It's in Florida down at the uh, Kennedy, Space Center by Kennedy Space Center, Cape Canaveral. This is the rover tucked inside uh, the descent stage. Underneath it is the heat shield. Above it is the cruise stage. So while it's on its way for uh, six, seven months to Mars, when we're communicating uh, electronically with it, with radio waves and sending stuff back and forth, it'll be with the computers and stuff on, on this thing, which is carrying the rover inside. There's some people getting it tucked away. So there's the heat shield now attached. And when they get to the Mars Martian atmosphere, this will get just discarded. Uh, the heat shield will protect the high temperatures from the friction when it gets in. Um, 
the this will deploy parachutes to slow it down. Then the heat shield will come off, and and this thing in the middle here will be taking pictures and making measurements, and it'll be looking for a specific place to land, and then it'll lower the rover on a on a string, basically a rope, a heavy duty rope, and eventually set it down in in, in a fairly specific place. There's a a relatively small region where they're gonna where they're gonna try to land this thing. They will actually set it down on the ground. This is just how they landed Curiosity back in 2012. Set it on the ground and then cut the string and fly out of the way. And then the rover will hopefully start operating on the surface. So it's now inside the top of this rocket. And so here's the top of the rocket. And I'm not sure, maybe it's already been attached to the bottom of the rocket. There's the bottom of the rocket. This is the Atlas V. It'll be launching from Florida, Cape Canaveral, hopefully July 30th. If not July, sometime between July 30th and August 15th. That's the launch window they have. While you're waiting for it to launch, and then while you're waiting for it to actually get to Mars, you can have some fun. Again, go, uh, this is on NASA's Mars uh, website. Uh, you can go to the Mars Perseverance photo booth, upload some pictures of yourself, your friends, um, and then they give you five different backgrounds that you can put them in, and then you can share them on social media. Great way to have fun and also to get the word out so that everybody knows that this launch is happening and that you can watch it live. And then when the landing happens in February, you can watch that live as well. And this is where Perseverance is landing. It's Jezero Crater. Uh, I think it's about 30 miles across, something like that, relatively. Um, it's an ancient lake on Mars. There was an ancient river that flowed into the lake and deposited sediment. In fact, there is a sediment, a, a, river, a river delta of sediment sitting where the river spilled into the lake over 3 billion years ago and deposited that sediment. And uh, Perseverance is going to be landing either on the sediment or right next to it and then it'll be climbing up the sediment and heading over to the crater walls and that's really where they think the if there was you know some kind of pond scum or microbial life living in that ancient ocean that's where they think they can see we'll be able to see evidence on on the rocks we see evidence like that from microbes living uh, in water on the earth over three billion years ago so it's it's possible if there was microscopic life in this ancient lake that was fed by an ancient river on Mars over 3 billion years ago, it's possible we'll be able to find that evidence or maybe suggestions of it. Maybe it'll be confirmed someday when those samples that Perseverance collects are actually brought back to the Earth, hopefully in the 2030s. 2031 is the target date right now, but sometimes those slip. So that landing, by the way, they know down to the, the like the minute, they know exactly where and when they're landing. February 18th, two o'clock in the afternoon, Central Time, Peoria, uh, in Jezero Crater. So you can watch that live on NASA's website while it's happening. It'll be really exciting, really scary, really nervous because there's a lot invested in this. It's going to be awesome if it succeeds. But it, as we've seen, you know, NASA's eight for nine. Um, it's, and Europe is over too, and the Soviets were over, I don't know what, five, six. Um, it's not easy. It's not a guarantee. Hopefully, they'll be successful. And then you can follow the whole mission, which will hopefully last for years, um, and, this awesome, and join in this awesome exploration of our neighbor planet. And who knows, maybe, maybe one day, for any kids uh, uh, following, maybe one day you will be on Mars exploring the red planet, because that is NASA's long-term goal. And not only NASA, but SpaceX, which just sent NASA astronauts to the space station, their long-term goal is to send people to Mars as well. So you could be one of those people. All right, last last slide. These are this is the launch window, just so just to give you a sense. July 30th is the earliest it'll launch, and hopefully that's when it will launch, unless there's some problem that comes up or maybe the weather is not favorable that day. If they launch, it'll be as early as 6:50 in the morning, Central Time Peoria. Not only can you watch it on NASA, but we'll be live streaming with me and Kyle and Renee, the planetarium director. Uh, so you can follow us on like Facebook Live uh, during the launch. And every day there's like a two hour window when they can launch. So 
maybe they won't launch at 650, maybe they will, but if it gets to like 850, they'll have to, and they don't launch, it'll maybe be the next day. So every day it's a little bit different time, um, but you can follow us, follow us on Facebook. We'll be posting updates to it. And again, we'll be live streaming uh, when that launches. And I'm sure we'll be doing live streaming um, in February when it, when it lands, hopefully safely in that ancient lake on Mars. But you only have till uh, between July 30th and August 15th before the window closes. So hopefully we'll get it in there. And that's it. So now you guys know about the rover, maybe more than you wanted to know, maybe not enough. If you want to know more, there's tons of wonderful Mars books at the library, websites, Wikipedia, lots of wonderful stuff out there. And again, the Mars exploration page that NASA has, you can follow all these missions. Are there any, uh, any other questions or anything before we say goodbye? To yeah. Yeah. yeah, guys. <laughs> This is, um, if you guys have any questions, this is your opportunity. Um, I have a question actually. So it looks like a lot of missions to the red planet don't actually manage to get there. Uh, would you say there's a Mars curse? I wouldn't, I, I'm, a, I'm an optimist because uh, a lot of people will say how hard it is to, mar to get to Mars and it's like 50% success rate. But you notice the success rate was way lower <laughs> in uh in the 60s and even in the early 70s when these things were just starting and the success rate after a few disappointments in the 90s has been uh pretty good uh you know ever since nasa's two you know nasa had two failed missions in the late 90s everything they've done in the 21st century to mars has been successful including uh Three rovers, two other landers, three satellites, uh, and six of the and, and and three of those satellites and two of the two of the land one of the rovers and one of the landers are still operating today. So we we're getting better and better. Again, it's no guarantee, but I think uh, um, no, there's no Mars curse. It's very exciting and optimistic. Yeah. So. So uh, Perseverance is due to launch on July 30th, but it's not due to land until February. Why does it take so long to get to Mars? Because Mars is millions of miles away. And, and that's also why we can't launch, you know, why, if it's, something happens and it's ready to go in December, we can't launch it in December because by then, actually Mars, we're catching up to Mars. So as we catch up to Mars, we can launch and we get all of the uh, speed of the Earth, which I believe is going 67,000 miles per hour or so around the sun. We get all that speed going with us <laughs> as we launch the rover in that direction towards Mars. Um, and then, so it's got all that speed of the earth moving around the sun. And so it takes less energy to do that, but it's um, still, I don't know, it's closest. It's still, it'll be closest in October. It'll be like 30, 40 something, 50 million miles away takes a really, really long time. In fact, it's so long that actually uh, uh, when it lands and we hopefully get the first signal back telling us that it's landed, well, that signal will have left Mars, I don't know, 10 minutes earlier, uh, taking at the speed of light, something like 10 minutes to get to us from, from the red planet. Any, anywhere from like five to, to 20 minutes or something like that from Mars. Ooh. So it's just, it's far away. That's why it just looks like a bright, star in the sky instead of the awesome world that we see when we look at the moon. Yeah. Okay, uh, well, if there are no further questions, then that's going to do it for today's live stream. Thank you guys so much for joining the Pure Riverfront Museum's Dome Planetarium today. Oh, wait, let me mention one thing, sorry. One more thing. I should say, I should mention, we also have a, a new live planetarium show every day at four o'clock, Tuesday through Saturday, which we'll be playing through the year and at least up until the launch. So you can learn about that and fly in our pretend spaceship to the red planet and go down and see where they landed and, and see the satellites and the moons and stuff like that. So if you want more in the planetarium environment, which is where this would be, if we didn't have the, you know, the current pandemic, we'd have this in, in the planetarium and we get to do a bunch of other cool stuff in the planetarium, but you can still come space out. We've got, you know, masks, for everybody in the in the museum and the planetarium, and uh, extra spaces between seats, 
so that everybody's spaced out six feet at, at minimum. And so it's safe to come in, safe to come in uh, if you want to see some more Mars stuff. Four o'clock, Tuesday through Saturday, any day, our planetarium show will be the Mars show. Okay, that's it. Sorry. Cool. Yeah, definitely come to the Mars show. That's going to be a lot of fun. Um, so yeah, anyways, that's going to do it for today's show. Um, thank you, Nick, so much for the incredible presentation. It was Wait, one more thing. <laughs> one more thing. All right. I'm waving bye bye with this. I should also mention we I bought this in the in the museum store. So not only is Mars in the museum store with his polar ice cap head, very cute, uh, but all the planets and some dwarf planets and the sun and the moon and so very cute, very fun collection for anybody who likes space. I got There's wall. also a 13 foot dome of the moon. A 13 oh yes, <laughs> a 13 foot uh, model of the moon that you can see in the. Uh, in the lobby, if you've entered into the museum, you look straight up, there's a giant moon. Uh, it was just recently installed and it looks super cool. So if you want to come to the museum and check that out, I really, really would really recommend that. So, okay. And if there's nothing else, then that's going to do it for today's live stream. Thank you guys so much for watching. You guys were fantastic. Um, look, look, look forward to more live streams like this. We'll be live streaming uh, some more celestial events like maybe the opposition to Saturn or Comet Neowise. That's that's a hot topic in the sky right now. Oh and yeah, we're gonna go look. You're gonna go look at it tonight, aren't you? I'm hopefully gonna go look at it. Yeah. Um, it's not really cloudy tonight. I don't know. Oh okay. But, um, well, next clear <laughs> night under the next big clear dip night. Room. Yeah. If you guys weren't aware, there is a comet in the sky right now, Comet Neowise. That is the brightest comet since Comet Hale Bopp in uh, 1997, at least for the northern hemisphere. If you haven't seen that comet yet, honestly, like go see it. Um, Jubilee, go out to maybe Jubilee. I know they have a lot of really cool sunflowers right now out there. So if you go out in there, you get to see some sunflowers. And you might also be able to see a comet in the sky. And I tell you, it was one of the most incredible things I have seen um, in the nighttime sky. I think. And you made a video with Renee, so they could yes. check the video of how how to watch, where to look, and when to look. And yeah. Uh, it's, it's a, it's a, don't miss this site. It's a ton of fun. It's, it's an amazing site. Okay. Well, on that note, that's going to end it for today. Thank you guys so much for watching. And I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your day. Bye guys. Hello.